Welcome to the Entrepreneur Next Door, and this is Ev Ash. It's my pleasure to welcome Farrell Vernon to the podcast. Farrell, uh, good morning. Uh, it's almost good afternoon for us. Uh, please introduce yourself. Give me your 60-second elevator pitch. How's that? There we go. Well, it's great to be here, Seth. Thanks for having me. Uh, 60 seconds. My name is Farrell Vernon. I am the Chief Operating Officer at Written Word Media. Written Word Media is a company that helps uh, authors, uh, people that write books, largely independent authors, but not exclusively independent authors, uh, connect with a large audience of readers to help market and sell their books. Uh, our business is a family business. My wife and I run the business together, and that's uh, definitely going to be the, the theme of my journey. So uh, great to be here. Excited to talk. Perfect. You, you're a brave man to have your <laughs> wife and you work together. That means you're complimentary. Uh, it's, it's almost like, I think running a business for a married couple is what, what people used to tell me years ago, that, that if you choose to put wallpaper up, that's a number one cause for divorce. Because for some reason, wallpaper is like, a, is like a thing. I don't know. Anyway, so let's go back to history. You're 15, 16 years old. What does Farrell want to be when he grows up? Yeah, um, that's an interesting time for me because I, I definitely didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up, which I think is fairly common as a teenager. What I will say is I grew up in an entrepreneurial household. So my father ran a hotel business. My mother was an artist. So those are two huge influences on my life. Um, and around 15, I started mowing the lawn. That was when my dad was like, I'm done with this chore, Farrell. <laughs> Here's how to use the lawnmower. Um, and I didn't mind it, it was fine, like being outside. Uh, and so I mowed the lawn for a little while um, and a neighbor next door who also probably didn't wanna mow his lawn but he did, his kids were much smaller, came over and he said, hey, you know, could you mow me my, my lawn, I'll pay you. And I said, sure. And so I went over there, I mowed his lawn and he gave me 20 bucks. And I remember that was the first, that was like my first client ever. Right. And I remember that moment of just being like, I like this. <laughs> this is fun. Right. You can work and make money, which uh, as a teenager and as a student, you, you have very little opportunity to do that. Uh, a friend of mine up the street kind of felt the same way. So we started our own lawn mowing business. Uh, we had like 11 lawns. And so as a 15, 16 year old kid, that was sort of the first business I ran. And um, I think what I learned very quickly is that I don't want to be in the lawn care business. Um, but also I loved having our own brand and like our own company. And I loved, you know, being able to support myself and buy the things that I wanted to buy, um, and go the places I wanted to go without having to ask my parents for anything. Um, and lawn mowing helped me do that. So I think that was probably the seed of like the entrepreneurial journey is for me is like mowing lawns and watching my dad run hotels. Um, but I think if you'd asked a 15 year old Farrell, I'm not sure that's what he would have told you. Well, you had, a, you had a good taste of money, uh, and mm -hmm. I guess you didn't have to rely on your parents' allowance if they gave you some. That's uh, right. And was, so who paid for the gas for the lawnmowers? Did you pay it, or did your father give you the money? Yeah, no, I paid for it. I think the first two, two or three times I did it, you know, I used gas from the garage, and I remember going to my dad and saying, hey, dad, we're out of gas. And he's like, yeah, that's, that seems like a problem, Farrell. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, at the time, I couldn't drive. Uh, so I had to, I had to get my mom to take me to the gas station and fill up a gas can and I had to pay for it, um, out of the money that I earned. So that was like, you know, your kind of first lesson in unit economics. <laughs> um, and, uh, I think, you know, after a while we had enough money, I think we bought like an edger. So we actually offered like one extra service. We did, you know, mowing and edging. Um, but yeah, I, I paid for the gas. I think I remember the, the blade broke once I had to go figure out how to buy a lawnmower blade. Um, again, I was young, and so I had to get my mom to take me. So we drove in the station wagon to the hardware store, uh, and I figured that out. But um, I have very, you know, positive and, and early memories of those moments. Do, do you remember the the neighbors, the size of the neighbor's lawn, by any chance? Um, I mean, I can picture it in my head. It took me about forty five minutes, maybe an hour, to do to do the whole thing, depending uh, on so, you know, the season. I mean. I, I don't know what year that was, but I'm I'm assuming the 20 bucks an hour back then was not bad. Oh, it was good money. It's good money now. I mean, I think, yeah. you know, I don't think I really knew how good I had it. Um, that was just sort of like what the first person offered me. So next time anybody else, I said, oh, it's 20 bucks to mow your lawn. And I uh, probably could have, you know, messed with my pricing a little bit. But um, 
you know, I, I was I was early. I was young. So where where did you grow up? What 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 state city are we talking about? Yeah, this is Northern Virginia, um, the suburbs outside of D.C. Uh, so my okay. dad ran a hotel company in downtown D.C. Uh, and the neighborhood that we were in, um, if if you're somebody who stays in the D.C. area, you know, for the most part, you're in you know government politics, uh, government contracting. Uh, something like that, and so there were houses near us that were diplomat houses that would that would turn over. Um, there, you know, there would be a family from New Zealand or a family from Australia, um, and you know, so we'd get to know them. And then, you know, most of my dad's business was related to government contracts and lobbying, and uh, that's who comes to DC to stay to stay at hotels for the most part. So, so you don't have any exciting stories about a bunch of Russian spies that move next door. <laughs> <laughs> you the lawn and you ran over a USB stick and not okay that's fine uh, no, no no stories like that I think uh, uh, if there were any spies nearby they were very good because I didn't notice them no, so now you know what kind of books I like to read we'll get to the yeah. book, book part so so we fast forward from your lawn entrepreneurial adventures to you go to BU as in Boston University and yeah. you study classical civilization that's what linkedin says right that's so what linkedin says and linkedin is not wrong uh, linkedin is right about that the the, the underlying truth is uh, i got into college uh, to do computer engineering and then i realized uh, i was again i was young made some dumb calls i was like oh, i don't want to take chemistry so i switched to computer science and then computer science was really really hard and i had this moment where I had like studied all night for this test. And I was in this small little classroom with like eight people uh, in one of the computer science classes. And I showed up at the test and there was like a hundred people in this room. And I was like, none of these people are in my class. Like, why are they here? And I, I leaned over to the guy next to me before the, you know, the test started. And I was like, hey man, are you in my class? And he's like, oh yeah, but I never get a class. <laughs> and so there were, you know, 90% of the people in that class were good enough that they didn't have to show up at class uh, to be there. And so that was a light bulb moment for me. And I'm like, yeah, this might not be the thing where I'm best used to spending my time. And I kind of bounced around majors a little bit. And eventually what I figured out is like, I just didn't like school very much and I needed to work. And so I picked a major that allowed me to graduate early, graduated early from college and started working right away. So what kind of a job do you get with a classical civilization <laughs> degree? Uh, I rented cars at Budget Rent-A-Car in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So I got up at six in the morning. I went down there. I wore, you know, a name tag and the little branded polo shirt or the branded uh, sweatshirt because it was freezing most of the time. I'd go brush snow off the cars. Uh, and then I would, you know, say, hey, can I have your license, credit card, type in, you know, help people rent cars. And I did that for a couple of months before I realized that I needed a real job. And I finally found a job at, at the hospital doing some administrative work. Um, which is kind of how I started my way onto sort of a, a career in front of a computer instead of in front of a, uh, you know, a desk. So uh, just, just for timing perspective, we're talking mm -hmm. 2005, where you join Center for Integration of Medicine and Innovation Technology, CIMIT, yeah. yep. which uh, I, I spent 20 years of my work life in the medical industry. So this Oh, cool. the, the, the title itself for 2005 is pretty progressive. When you when somebody uses the word integration, when it comes to to medicine, that's pretty. It, it's it's pretty advanced. I mean, what today yeah. integration is what everybody's talking about. But so tell me what about that job? What what was that about? Yeah, that was a cool place. Um, had some problems. I'll talk about. But you know, they really were trying to put brilliant engineers in Boston and brilliant doctors in Boston. So the Harvard, you know, MIT system and put those people together and have them solve gnarly problems. So that was cool. I was low man on the totem pole. I was actually working for a, a group called uh, the, the simulation group. We built uh, fake bodies that you'd practice surgery on mostly for uh, military medics. That uh, was funded in large part by the Department of Defense. And so, you know, I learned a lot about medicine, a lot about military medicine, which is crazy how little training those guys get before they get shipped off to the battlefield. Um, the thing I learned there, there was a lot of smart people, like wonderful people that I worked with there, but it was squarely in this academic nonprofit world. And so we'd go to these conferences, we'd present this prototype, some general would come by, everybody would get all worried. Uh, and, and he would look at it for three minutes and either, you know, nod or not. And that was like, oh, he liked it or he didn't like it. And then like nothing would happen, right? Like this thing just sat in the lab and we'd ship it around from all these different conferences. And that was my job. I would go and do the show at, 
be on my feet for 10 or 12 hours, you know, doing demos at these conference halls. And, um, you know, it, I started to get frustrated. I'm like, well, why, you know, these medics, these guys are 18, 19 years old. They have no training. Um, they need this product that we're developing. It's a, you know, a body that helps them practice a few medical procedures. Uh, why can't we sell it to them? you know, or, or, or even give it to them or figure out how to make more than one, <laughs> you know, and, and the people that I worked with were brilliant. I mean, they're super smart and a lot of them taught me a lot of things and I, and I owe them a, a great debt of gratitude, but um, they weren't business-minded people, right? These were researchers. And um, I realized at that moment that, you know, this nonprofit research world is not for me, right? There wasn't enough movement. There wasn't enough speed. There wasn't enough um, people didn't move on to the next thing. They just stayed and they like, you know, I, I call it polishing a shiny spoon. Um, they kept making it better and better. I was like, it's good enough. <laughs> you know, we could sell it right now if we had a company. Um, but that just wasn't the mentality of the people there. Um, and that, you know, that after being there for a couple of years, learning some things, taking some classes, I realized, you know, I, it was time for me to move on. And that, that's kind of when I, I realized that I kind of found my way back to business was after that. So then you join Reverb Nation, yeah. which I guess is, I, I, I'll let you talk about it. It's about the artist services, something like that? Yeah, Reverb Nation uh, is a, a software platform for musicians, for bands. Um, and it's to help them uh, you know, market and promote their music, manage their music, get opportunities, all this kind of stuff. And when I started there, there was like eight or nine people. It was like just under 10. And when I left, there was almost 100. Um, and the, the founders there um, were, who were my bosses, uh, were amazing. And they taught me a lot. They gave me a lot of opportunity that I'm very grateful for. Um, and I, you know, I did made some missteps, but I also learned a lot and I worked my brains out. Um, and it was really a formative experience where I learned about how to, how to scale software, how to build software, how to build teams of people. Um, you know, that's where I learned about hiring and firing and scaling and all these, all these really important things that I've taken with me into this business. Um, and also where I sort of fell in love with this independent creative person, right? We're in this creative economy and you've got YouTube influencers now who are, who are pretty new, but these sort of solopreneurs that are doing something kind of artistic and creative with their lives and bands are a very different animal than uh, than authors, but they both have the same ethos, which is, hey, I want to make something in this world, and uh, I'm going to figure out a way to do it. And so the software platforms I've been involved in really the last 15 years have been helping that, that group of people, that creative class. Well, you know, my, my son is a incredibly talented uh, jazz musician who, oh, cool. who chose very early on because he was he was taught by master classes by some incredibly successful, famous people. And everyone said, are you sure you want to do this? It's a hell of a way to make a living. So jazz is probably the toughest part of music. But my point is, generally speaking, musicians are really bad business people. They're just That's right. uh, artists in general. And I apologize if I'm generalizing, but I think uh, I won't get into details, but I've known quite a few artists in my lifetime. and they're super talented, but they really stink at business. It's not, they're not wired for that kind of stuff. And I always kind of try to understand why is it? And modern theory I have is I think that by moving away from music or art into the business piece, maybe compromises who they are because they consider themselves artists, right? I'm creating something. You should listen to my music or buy my music or buy my painting. I shouldn't have to sell myself. Those two are kind of like internal conflicts. I don't, they're not really comfortable doing it. So you develop a platform that allows bands in this case. To yeah, I, I think that's a really interesting dichotomy. And, and um, you know, what I, the way I think about it is it's a difference between art and design. So art is something you make to elicit emotional reaction. Right? It's a painting, you want somebody to feel a certain way and that's it, that's the only reason you did it. So that's, that's like artistry and like um, to, to a certain extent, that's what my mother did growing up, right? She was a, a quilt artist, she used textiles fabrics to create her art, um, but she you know, didn't really sell them. She did it for the love of it because this is something she saw in her head, the vision that she wanted to create. But then there's design, right? And I think a lot of what the independent creatives today do is they design a product. So 
you know, an author, somebody that we work with who's writing a mystery novel or a spy novel, right? Those, that's something that you maybe like to read. Um, they're designing a product and it's an artistic product, but it also has a function that it's designed to give you three to four hours of entertainment, right? And it's designed to keep you entertained. And if it doesn't keep you entertained, then it's not good. It's not a well-designed product. And I think that difference between sort of art and design, both of which are trying to get at the emotional nature of something that you're, that you're consuming, um, there is a difference there. And when you go to an art museum, that's art and that's just there to make you feel a way. But when you read like a, a fiction book, right, that also has another, another intention and that intention is entertainment. So I think there's, I think about this all the time, right? So this, this difference between artistry and design is something that I think is a really interesting place to explore. Hmm. Interesting. So uh, you spend six and a half years at Reverb Nation and at some point something I'll say something happens, it doesn't have to be an incident, yeah. but there's a point where you decide to leave the, I'll call it the corporate mothership, and then off you go into creating your own company, right? Written word media. So yeah. what, what drove you to make that change? Yeah, so that's that's an interesting question. So while I was at Reverb Nation, um, and my wife and I both come from entrepreneurial families. And so we talked about working together long before we actually did. Um, we actually, I have some cousins and, and uh, they work together, or my cousin and his wife, or my cousin and her husband, they work together and they started this company. We went to visit them and they had this amazing setup and their family and their life and the way everything worked and they were in complete control. And we were like, man, they have it figured out. Like that's the life for us. And so it took us a long time, but we kind of modeled how we wanted our life to look at uh, after them. And, um, and, and so, you know, you talk about the incident, like what happened is uh, my wife was trying to promote uh, her mother's book, my mother-in-law, and we're both in digital at the time. She's a digital marketing consultant. I'm in product development at Reverb Nation. So we're like, hey, we can build a little website and figure out how to promote this book. So we built this uh, little site called Free Booksy. We try to give the book away for free and uh, crickets can't give it away. And so what we realize is there's this, this problem. And so my wife at the time is running an online marketing consultancy. She spins up this uh, Facebook page. I built a little website and we, she starts running traffic to that website to try to promote these books that works. And then she starts running more traffic to it because she's trying to experiment with the new ad platforms. Facebook's ad platform is just coming out at this point, right? Google's is mature, but has not everybody knows how to use it. So she's doing these experiments. The Facebook page starts to grow. The website starts to get a little traction. And then one day an author writes in and says, hey, can I pay to be on the, on the website? And like that is uh, kind of like entrepreneurship 101. Like when somebody offers, you know, hey, I'll pay you to mow my lawn or I'll, I'll pay you to be on the website. You say yes, right? And so that is um, kind of the origin story. And then she started running it. I was not really involved for a while. Um, and started growing it. And then it'd been kind of six years and I was kind of getting ready for, for, for something new. And we took a look at the business and we realized, hey, this is a real business. It's, it's still interns and Google Docs and things moving around. Like it's not, it's not there yet, but the demand side was there. Um, and so I quit my job and we reincorporated the company as Written Word Media. Uh, we built some software to scale it. Uh, and that took us about nine months. Uh, and then we kind of had the business. And so it was really, it was really sort of um, trade-offs during that time. And you know, for anybody who's listening, who's trying to figure out like how they can get started on their journey, I'm not saying do it my way, but it's one way. And basically what happened is while she was growing the beginning of it, I was working full time. We we're collecting my salary, my benefits. And then when I quit, she continued to do consulting gigs to kind of help fund our life while we were getting this thing off the ground. Um, and that's how we were able to get the business started really in about 18 months without taking outside funding, raising any money, borrowing any money. Um, it was very, very difficult. Um, like it's very hard to operate with such minimal resources, um, but we were pretty fortunate to be able to get it done. So it's, you know, when you say sort of nonchalantly, so I quit my job and then I joined my wife. Uh, it, it's, it sounds great, but when you say I quit my job, because I've done it 10 and a half years ago, you walk away from consistent paycheck and yeah. whatever else comes with it. And if, yep. if your wife was an independent and if you had medical benefits that carried her, then you walk away from that. 
that could be scary. Uh, it was scary. Yeah, we had two yeah. kids at the time. My daughter was five months old. Like in retrospect, it, it seems a little reckless, but that's what we did. Yeah, <clears throat> I was going to say, and if you have kids in the mix, yeah, now it gets even scarier because, well, you know, we got this little five-year-old. She needs to eat. We can live on tuna sandwiches and pizza once a week to celebrate life, but this kid needs to yeah. keep going. Um, so it's not... It's not an uh, uh, an easy decision to say, okay, I'm just going to quit my job and go. Um, wh when I mentor people who are considering entrepreneurship or people that actually work and are unhappy, yeah, uh, what, what I tell them first is if you go to work every day and at the end of the day, you don't, the, the point where you brush your teeth and you look in the mirror and you can say, am I happy? Did I was I productive today? Do I feel fulfilled about the eight plus hours I spend working at this place? Uh, and if the answer, am I appreciated? Do do I do I feel that I'm making a difference? If the answer to all those things are no, then I tell them, then dude, you need to quit and don't compromise. But what I mean is, don't quit your job because I said so. Actively start to find something better. And by doing it, you'll feel a little better and eventually maybe you'll be able to get out of there. But just quitting on its own is, is you know, economically stupid. It's just kind of financial suicide. That's not what I'm saying. Entrepreneurship is the other piece of it, right? I'm, I'm working with a company today that, that sells businesses for people who want to switch from the corporate world to owning a business. And one of the things that that you challenge with is, and these are people that are working fairly high end executives, right? So if you're making three hundred thousand dollars a year and you're working your ass off and you travel and you there's no yeah. free time, and you look at your kids and say, "I want to see them grow up," you know the, the regular story. You know, ah, I'm going to start. Maybe I should start my own business. Uh, not. Not so fast, right? It's, it's, a pretty, <laughs> it's a pretty scary proposition. It is. That, you know, you have to understand when you make that move and you quit, there's no paycheck. There's not, nobody's paying you for anything. It's on, it's on you to now earn every dollar that comes in. And you said 18 months, which I kind of found was, seems to be the consistent time frame, generally to from when you start and until you get to a point where you begin to actually figure it out and things begin to click. It's somewhere around the 18 months. I don't know why, but that's what happens. So yeah. uh, on top of that, you quit your job and then you and your wife are working it, which is yeah. it's pressure. I mean, you, you now have to make it happen. Yeah, it was a lot of pressure. And I think, you know, what took a little bit of the pressure off is that she had a few consulting clients that were on a regular basis. So we had a little bit of income. And, and, you know, what I told myself, which I believed um, was, hey, you know, I'll give, we have a little bit of savings, you know, she's making a little bit of money. So our bank account's not going to, you know, plummet, but it's going to go down and we're comfortable with how much it's going to go down. Um, and what I told myself is like, hey, you know, I did a great job at Reverb Nation. I could be, go back and be a software executive somewhere if I really had to for my family. And so that was always the backup plans. Like, hey, if this doesn't work, um, I can always, I can always go do that. Now I, I told myself that now, you know, here we are, whatever, seven, eight, eight years later, I'm not sure I could go back, <laughs> right. I'm not sure I could leave yeah. this life because, um, you know, I care for it so deeply and the people and, and the company that we built and you put so much into it. But, um, you know, that, that is one of the things I told myself when I left. And I think it was true probably for that first year or two, I felt like I could have gone back, but at a certain point you, um, you cross the threshold and you're an entrepreneur now. And I can't really imagine going back to, to the other world. Yeah. And, and I think all of us who, who make the bold decision to quit paying jobs and become entrepreneurs, we tell ourselves the same story. Well, if it doesn't work and I was going to come back yeah. to the job, right? In my <laughs> case, I was in my fifties. I told myself that a few times and I realized, you know what? That's never going to happen. I sort of in that that famous story about this the guy that was conquering an island and they came by boats whatever the the general was as soon as they landed on the island he burned all the boats yeah he literally burned them right so for me i burnt the boat there was no going back for me uh you know you're a young guy yeah of course you can go find another job that's a story we tell ourselves to 
to somehow overcome the incredible anxiety that comes yes. with, I don't know if I'm going to get a client tomorrow of this yeah. income, but the, the reality is that once you taste freedom and the ability to not lead your life based on corporate politics, what someone else told you to do, what someone else told you how to say and how to behave, when somebody is hovering over you to make micromanage you, all that nonsense goes away. Uh, and all of a sudden you taste the ability to work as hard as you want, but you can also quit for a couple of hours and go for a walk. And yeah. you don't get permission from anybody to do it. And it's perfectly okay, right? So it, it's interesting that that you said that, but we all go through it. And at some point, could I get a job? Yeah, maybe, but I'm not doing that. I can't imagine yeah. <laughs> going to work. I can't imagine going to work for somebody again. Just, just, yeah. Insane. So, yeah, I, I will say, you know, one of the things that, that I goes ebbs and flows in sort of the, the history of this company is what you said about like going for a walk or for me, it's like going fishing or going to pick up my kids or something like that in the middle of the day and not needing permission. And, and that is definitely part of it. But I think what we've been trying to do the last couple of years and COVID has, a, has had a big impact on this, I think, is extend some of that freedom to the people that work for us. Because, you know, that feeling of, like you said, like somebody's watching, you need permission for everything, like that stinks. And so if you try... And, you know, varying degrees of success, everything's an experiment, but, you know, we've tried, especially since COVID to really encourage people to have that freedom, um, you know, to, to go do the things that they need to do during the day, as long as they're getting their work done. And I think, um, I think we've been somewhat successful at that, but it is definitely, I think, a draw that even five years ago was kind of for the select few. And now I think people almost expect it. And it's our job as leaders to figure out how to provide it. Well, what's interesting is that entrepreneurship in most cases is sort of like remote work, right? You're working from home, you're working in your basement, in a garage, wherever you find a place to work. And if you don't have that, then you go to the library and you sit in the corner and you use the free Wi-Fi, whatever. Oh, you go to Panera, you get a, a cup of soup and you use their Wi-Fi, whatever creative uh, initiative you take to to do what you have to do uh, and it's not for everyone right and 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 again we all go through this you work from home and the entrepreneurship comes with incredible fear and anxiety of yes what's going to happen next can I make it happen you start you start to have self-doubt even though internally you might be confident but things you know you know you know that things just don't happen because you flick your fingers, you know? Right. Most of the time, our best plans completely blow up because something came out of left field and we didn't think about it. Mostly because we deal with human beings and they're completely irrational, right? So we can't count on anything. You have to keep going and you keep going. And, and so, but for me, and I've done a couple of remote jobs in my career, I found that I was in the most productive working from home and as opposed to being in the office where there are so many distractions so covid came in and forced in a reality on so many companies who are spending a fortune on real estate the smart ones are saying wait a minute why do we need this stuff yes the social aspect of meeting your your co-workers yeah so the smart companies did away with all this office nonsense and they bring you back maybe a couple of times a week for social gathering. They don't need to spend a fortune in New York City or somewhere else renting places for people to just hang over the cubicles Monday morning and spend an hour talking about the weekend and then go into the coffee machine and spending another hour and other nonsense. So we are incredibly productive working from home. As entrepreneurs, we go through a process. The first process is Holy shit! I'm on my. I'm by myself. It's just me. <laughs> There's nobody else. I need to go find some clients. I need to get some income. Oh my god, this is scary. I think I'm. I think I'm hungry. I'm gonna go up to the kitchen and get a snack. Right? That's our. That's our flight mechanism to escape yeah. the reality. So I go get a snack and I come down, and I'll talk a little bit. And I say, you know. I don't think my desk is organized. I'm going to redo my file cabinet, and I don't even have clients yet, right? I'm I'm reorganizing for the third time, but at some point we get to the point to say, "Dude, quit the crap, man!" I mean, you can reorganize. You want a sense of control over your life. That's why we organize. Yes, but you got to do the work. 
And we, we get to the point where the reality hits and we stop running to the kitchen every two minutes to eat something and we stop reorganizing and then we get into the grind and we do the work, right? And if you keep it up and you're consistent, then things happen. And how fast they happen depends on the industry, depends on the business. So yeah. I think that's like, that's a, that's a like fabulous point for anybody who's listening is like consistent, like inertia is a powerful thing. Right. And so, and so if you're consistent and you keep that inertia moving forward, you're still going to hit the ups and downs of the, of the journey, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's just, it's not smooth. It's not straight, but like, if you grind, if you stay at it, if you stay pointed in the same direction, you know, those are the people that tend to have success, right? Like they find that the people that get up and work at the same thing every day tend to be lucky. <laughs> right. And I, and I think those things are connected and, you know, the early days, we, we did not such a great job of that. We had shiny object syndrome. We, you know, chased the new project here and a new project there that didn't end up panning out. And once we kind of figured out like, Hey, this thing, like selling more books for authors, like let's do that. And like, let's not do anything but that. Um, that's when the, the company really started to cook, right? It's, it's when you find your, your niche, your concept, whatever it is, and you just hang on for dear life and chase that thing. And I think that consistency and that grind is, is really, really important. Yeah, and, and you add to that um, a good dose of humility where don't, don't be afraid to ask for help. Yeah. Ask, the right, ask the right people. Uh, if you have any spare time, educate yourself, go out and learn what you need to learn to get better at what you do, because you don't have the resource of a company and say, oh, I'm going to send yeah. a seminar for three days and you can go do the time. It's, it's on you. And if you're a professional and you want to deliver, deliver value and service to whoever it is you, your clients are, um, you really need to be, re you need to be really good in what you do because to yeah. me, you can't. And what I would even argue, you know, if you have some spare time, read, I would actually argue part, part of your day should be reading. I mean, obviously I'm in the book business, I'm biased as hell, right? Yeah. But I think, you know, uh, you're absolutely right. Like when it's just you, like you can look, learning from books is cheap. Books are not expensive, right? Seminars are expensive. Finding one hour, two hour consultants are expensive. And so I've read a lot of books that have really helped us uh, and helped me and, and, you know, I think you can't read books all day, right? You have to work, but I think building that into your weekly or, you know, daily, if it's possible, but in a minimum weekly routine, uh, doing some self-improvement, doing some reading. Uh, I find that I, those are my most productive weeks when I'm in a good group of, of reading. So, so your wife tries to help her mother market a book and, and there a business is born, right? Yeah. Uh, what, so one person said, hey, can I join your website? What made you think that this could be, that this is an area where you can actually be successful? Yeah, and I think most people who've been successful on this journey, it's a time and a place, right? Mm -hmm. So at the time when this was happening, sort of you know, by luck or whatever you want to call it, the, the independent author movement is gaining traction. Amazon just launched uh, their uh, Kindle direct publishing platform. So you could take your Word document, upload it to Amazon, hit go, and you're selling a book, right? And that was pretty innovative at the time. And it was new. And so this, this influx of independent authors um, needed this service, right? It used to be this thing called publish and pray. You publish a book, hope for the best. It doesn't work, <laughs> right? Marketing works. And so you have to market a book. And so once we realized that and like, we're pretty good at marketing, we're pretty good at product development, building stuff. And so, so we built this solution for that. But I think it was, you know, recognizing a time and a place. This is a time when something's happening in our industry and people are writing and they need a marketing solution. And that's why they want what we have. And then, you know, tailoring what you're doing to that. Um, is important, but I do think there's a time and a place. So for everybody that's running a business, there's something happening in your industry that's going to either, you know, be a headwind or a tailwind or whatever, but you, you do have to pay attention to that stuff to figure out where you fit. So um, I, I am a, an author, published a, two business books. Mm -hmm. The first one was because uh, at least in my world, as a business coach, when I started to network as a former corporate executive who spent his time traveling around the world, I had no idea what the hell I'm supposed to do, except I quit and now I want to do my, my thing. 
everybody told me three things. You have to network, fine. You have to you have to become a speaker. So go call the chambers and everybody go speak. And the third piece, you got to write a book so that on your LinkedIn summary you can say speaker, author, blah, 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 blah. Okay. So the the networking part was relatively easy. Uh, I did that for a year like a madman and and quit completely cold turkey because I found it to be a complete waste of time. Uh, as a, relying on other people to market myself was insane. So I that's when my business took off and I stopped wasting time having coffee with people. They didn't have any money, wanted to sell me something. I'm I'm poo-pooing networking, although some people just will kill me for that. Uh, the speaking <laughs> the speaking piece. Okay, so I got some bites and I was able to speak in a few places. Did it get me anywhere? Nah, nah. When we say speaker, not not speaking at a chamber event, right? That's not it. The author piece, I didn't get to. Um, and then, but I was because I'm a writer and I was actively doing blogs. At some point, I had this brilliant idea: I'm going to take a collection of four years of blogs, put them together into a book by topics in my area, so marketing, sales, customer service corporate culture, put them together and, and publish it. So the person I picked to publish my book promised me the world, of course, uh, and nothing happened. Right? Yeah, when was this? What year was this? So this was, uh, I started my business in 2012. Yeah. Maybe it was 2014. I can go back to Amazon. The, the book still lives on Amazon like everything else. Uh, nothing really happened, right? So, of course, I had copies of the book. Oh, did you write a book? There's my copy. Fine. The, the reason people in my line of work write books, it becomes a, quote, unquote, maybe credibility aspect, although everybody yep. and their cousin four times removes the writing books today, so that's no longer the case. But for the smart ones, it's a way to, you give somebody one of your books to personally engage with them, and then that's a way to, generate a warm lead let's call it that way right it's it's an it's a nicer way than handing somebody a business card yeah um so okay didn't go anywhere it's fine um no i had no idea about publishing no idea about how to market the books left it alone um about a year ago plus i decided to publish a book about a topic that i've worked on and thought about for years which was a summary of things that i've seen mistakes that that business owners make in marketing uh, that consistently make those mistakes that stop them from growing. So I wrote the book this time, still being angry about the first one. Uh, <laughs> I decided to learn what I could learn about book publishing and marketing. Yeah, good for you. Not, not to do it on my own because I didn't have time to do it, but so that I can then choose who I want to work with if I pick a publisher. And and so you, so I'm a potential client for you, and I'm about to go rent to you. I'm in, in in a really big way. So what I found, Vernon, is that the the book publishing, the marketing part of publishing, was filled with as many crooks as the SEO world is. Everybody was, and some of them great marketeers they have beautiful websites and they and you know you know the guys that do the webinars and all the promises and all the stuff um and i studied it and i realized that it doesn't make any sense and so that's my, that's the first thing i want to throw out at you so if if you're going to go and and people have have asked me to pay somewhere between five thousand and twelve thousand dollars to help me market my book. And of course, because that's a lot of money. Oh, by the way, we're also going to get you some speaking engagements and you can sure. talk about all the, you know, all the stuff, they, the fluff they put on top of it. And what I said to them was, the reason I wrote the book was to, for people, for entrepreneurs to read it and understand why they're stuck and not growing because they all make the same mistakes consistently. I've learned that. 10 years that I've been coaching plus 30 years in the corporate world. It's cons it's pretty consistent. And I want to make a difference with the book. I'm not looking for clients and I'm not, and I know after studying the publishing industry 
that it's not a moneymaker unless I can sell thousands of books, right? So for me to go spend, let's take the middle, 5,000 to 12,000, let's let's pick seven grand, eight grand. For me to spend $8,000 on marketing my book, when I did the math of what the return on investment have to be in terms of what profits I would make through Amazon, I said, it makes no sense. I'm never going to sell enough books to do it. So I left it alone. I looked at Book BookBub, uh, which is one of the one of the places that I thought, well, they seem pretty credible. Um, so I I got involved with them a little bit. The Amazon world, I did my thing with Amazon ads, uh, got a little bit of spurt, you know, of of sales. And then if you don't keep up with it, as I learned, of course, like everything else, it's just going to dive right back down. And the number one sellers are going to push you down and you're never going to be seen again. So I, I decided to just walk away from the whole thing because it's a full-time job to do that, number one. Two, if you hire somebody, it's costly to the point that it makes no sense. And I think you're going to convince me maybe otherwise. Uh, but well, if I'm looking for clients and I'm charging $10,000 a month in consulting fees, I don't use myself as a consultant then yeah, of course I'm going to do it. Or if I'm going to use that to sell a webinar and it's recurring revenue, yes, but I don't do any of those things. Most of the people I know that wrote books don't do those things either. So right. help me, Vernon. I'm, 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 I'm down <laughs> yeah, with my so therapy session. There's so much to unpack there. So first of all, I, I will say the experience you had you know, 10 years ago where people are charging huge amounts, promising you the moon, that was rampant. Uh, back then it did and it was not cool like it was people taking advantage of an author's hopes and dreams and promising them something that wasn't realistic um, that has largely been put to bed in the industry so th those people are certainly still out there but there's a lot less of them and the people that remained are, are typically pretty good at what they do um, or they're people like us that offer a self-service product so our, our product is you know 100 bucks 150 bucks so you come you buy it you don't have to talk to anybody we run the ads you sell, you sell copies, that's it, right? So it's, it's cheap, it's transactional, uh, it's, it's effective. Um, and I think what you're seeing, you mentioned Amazon ads and BookBub, and these are all good techniques, but the, the thing that uh, is true for nonfiction, most of our customers are, are fiction, uh, like romance, science fiction, yeah. uh, thriller, whatever. Um, but you know, you're talking about nonfiction, business books and stuff, and the same dynamic occurs. It's people today are starving for content. They are hungry for more. And when they find a vein, they expect to be able to mine it. And so if you're a business book writer and you have one book, and if somebody likes it and you have nothing else for them, it's not going to work. And so the people that are the most successful are the people that are taking what's happening with storytelling, the broader story arcs, right? You see uh, Game of Thrones and some of these other series, things that are just very long stories, very interesting, intricate, intricate stories, um, and are doing that. So if you're even if you're a nonfiction author, you've got to have more. So like, hey, I love what Zev's doing. I want to read everything he's ever written. And if that's only one or two books, that's not a business. Um, mm -hmm. Now, a lot of nonfiction authors use their book, like you mentioned, as a lead magnet or as a way to get consulting gigs or whatever. And that's a different business model, right? That's not making money off of what you're writing. Most of our, our customers are making money off what they're writing. But the ones that are making money off of what they're writing, they write a lot, right? Yeah. And that's the, num that's the number one advice I give to people. And most people don't like to hear it. And unfortunately, that's the truth. It's the best thing you can do is you do have to market, right? Spend a little bit of time, a little bit of money marketing, because if you don't market, nothing will happen. And then write a lot, right? We have authors that are kicking out six, seven, eight books a year, right? I mean, that is their high volume producers. And that's what the world wants right now. And so you can fight that all you want and say, oh, I'm going to spend all year writing one quality book. And, and that's fine, but it'll take you, if you write one book a year, it'll take you seven or eight years before you have a, enough content that you're making money off of it. If you can figure out a way to write faster, um, almost assuredly as a writer in today's market, you'll be more successful. And so that's kind of uh, unsatisfying advice because like, hey, you know, I think it was super hard and emotionally taxing that you just went through for the past few months. Do it again, do it again, do it again. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. But, and, but it and, is the unfortunate dynamic of today's market. And, and you are pointing something that I realized as I was immersing myself in this whole independent publishing and marketing is that 
it's it's very skewed towards fiction. The nonfiction yes. piece yep. is is really hard. It's it's almost like my 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 son being a jazz musician. Jazz is a unique genre that is not for everyone, and it's really really hard to be successful being a jazz musician. I I think it's hard to be successful as a nonfiction writer unless you have such name recognition as a Gary yes. Vee or some of those guys. Yes. Fine, people are going to swallow the book because they think they're going to be Gary Vee if they read him, right? Fine. Because right, they like everything else he's produced, so I'll, right. I'll, I'll consume this, right? Yeah, and then I noticed that the people, even in my in my world of marketing, uh, Donald Miller, for example, is one guy that I followed him, and he's a pretty cool guy. Uh, built a pretty successful business, has probably a mailing list that's in the, uh, who knows, 50 to 100,000 names of people over the years. So when you, and that's my message to people who are writing a book and want to be successful, if your mailing list consists of a couple thousand people, not going to happen, right? So when Donald Niddle drives, uh, drops a book on a mailing list of 100,000 people that follow him or 50,000, of course, he's going to be a number one bestseller. And of course, because I follow him and I bought his book, I got the order it now deal pre-publishing yeah. so that he can push the ranking with the pre-sale because I learned that too. And of course, he gives me some freebie if I do this, whatever. So there's yeah. a whole universe of marketing books that's probably yes. as complicated as SEO for, for Google stuff. Uh, maybe not so technical, but same. Yeah, concept, that's right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, for me, the book was written not to make money, but to make a difference. For someone, you don't need to, to read more than that. Pick a chapter that's going to make a huge difference in your life as a business owner, because you're going to read and say, holy crap, I never thought about that. Yeah. Um, that's why I wrote it. And it's and it's purposely skinny, 100 pages, yep. because I looked at my competitors who are you know stuffing books at two to three hundred pages to create value so they can sell it? And I said, you know what? I know my universe of small business owners. I know them. I've lived in those trenches for my entire career. They're not going to read a three hundred page marketing book and take notes and ever follow up on anything. What they need is something, small bits of information with an action point. Now go do it. Come back and read the next chapter. They're not related. So. Um, Interesting. So does your platform serve only fiction writers? No, we serve nonfiction too, but, you know, candidly, it's fiction so much more popular, so much more vibrant. Yeah. I'd say it's probably 90, 95% fiction. Um, and, you know, with the dynamic you said about the mailing list, that's exactly what we do. We have a huge, massive mailing list. And essentially, if you have your own mailing list that's big, you should mail that, right? As, no matter what you're doing, business owner, author, whatever. Um, but if you don't, you can rent one from us. You pay us some money and you, we send your book to our list. Uh, and that, that's our whole business model, essentially. Hi, right, that's, that's, I mean, I like, that's, I like that because that's what we used to do in the, I'll call it the old days. Yeah. When renting lists was, was a thing, we could, we will get the list and put labels on them and send direct mail out. Uh, you know, you say basically rent my list, I'll send it on your behalf for my list. That's perfectly fine. The problem with book, book Bob and some of the other platforms uh, they're so slated towards fiction that even when they market to the nonfiction universe, you have to really be in their face nonstop and spend a lot of money, which again gets yeah. me to the point then, okay, so what's the point? I mean, why am I doing yeah. this? I, yeah, it, well, it's it's an interesting experiment in unit economics though, because um, if you have a lot of books, like it's just, it's sort of like you think about um, lifetime value of a customer, right? Yeah. So, um, and, and if you have 20 books that are each a dollar each, that's, you, and you expect people to read, you know, halfway through it, then lifetime value of your customer is 10 bucks. And so you can spend $9 to get someone to read book one, and you're still making money on that, even yeah. if you lose money on book one. And I think the savvy authors in our world, the people that we talk to on a regular basis, they understand that. And I think you mentioned something at the beginning of the show about how, like, artists and business people don't always match, right? And I think what, where we really try to help people um, and not always successful, those people that don't want to understand unit, unit economics, that don't want to think about the lifetime value of a reader, those, those are the people that kind of struggle to take their art and, and make it a commercially viable product. Um, but we do our best job to coach them in that. Yeah, no, that, so the, I think that's a good 
sort of like a win-win solution for people who just want to write for the sake of writing and making a difference yeah. like me and don't want to deal with the business aspect because that's not uh, look on a business side it's different I, I happen to be working with somebody in Africa and I'm going to introduce you to him uh who is a oh. who, who is a great writer I started to read his books uh, but he's in Africa and and I think he's struggling somewhat with getting more exposure to his books yeah. It's my kind of stuff with, you know, spy, adventure, action stuff. So oh, that's uh, great. I'll introduce you to him. So um, what's what's one thing you learned by working with your wife that could be an advice for people considering that insanely crazy adventure of being <laughs> a partner with, you or with somebody yeah. else? Um, you know, I think my wife and I are both extraordinary communicators uh, and sort of organized people. And so I think you have to have a lot of the same traits, but complementary skills, right? So my wife is a marketer. I'm much more technical and, and uh, on the product side. And so I think that was a good compliment. But at the same time, we're both very communicative and we would talk about things like, you know, hey, well, how's that going to make you feel if I do this podcast and instead of you, or if you do this, and like, how would you feel about if I did this and we did that? And so, um, you know, that's nauseating if you do that at a dinner party, <laughs> right? But uh, when we do it ourselves at home, it, it makes our working relationship work. And I think anybody that has a good marriage typically knows that um, you talk about it. Right, and that's that's one of the once one of the ways it gets good. And if you don't talk about it, then that's when sort of resentment starts and stuff happens. So um, you kind of take some of those skills, like hey, you know how to live together, we know how to raise kids together, we know how to do run the household together, and now we're figuring out how to run the business together too. Um, so I think if you you know if you do all those other things well and you're communicative, um, it can really work out. And for us, it's been amazing, right? Like we we own our own business, we can do what we want. Uh, with it. Uh, we can pay people what we think they should be paid. We can contribute to community organizations that we want to, not that, you know, we don't have to fight anybody for that. Um, and I think, you know, it's an amazing thing. The, the one thing I will say, the one flag, the thing that we missed, we talked about this ad nauseum before we did it. The one thing that we totally missed was getting sick. So when you know, a couple of years ago, I got the flu and obviously everybody in the house gets the flu. And then your entire executive founding team is out for the count for a week. Right. And, or if somebody's going through something like my couple of years ago, my dad was very, very sick. Um, and so I was in a little bit of crisis. Right. And then now my wife's backing me up both family wise and at the business. And I think that if anybody's considering it, that's something to understand is like, what is your personal support structure? And think about that before you take this leap, because having uh, a parent around, having a good nanny, babysitter, extended family, whatever it is, you will have to lean on those people. And I think anybody who's gone through this journey knows you cannot do it alone. You'll, you'll fail, right? So you have, to, you have to leverage your community and talk to people and take advantage of the health that people are offering you. Um, so that, that would probably be my biggest advice is, is prepare your community for this journey that you're going to take, whatever community means to you, whether it's neighbors or friends or family, whatever. Um, and I think that is something that we maybe didn't do the best job of at first, and we've done a very good job of it now. Um, but at first we kind of thought, oh, we can do anything, you know, we're, we're so smart, we're so good. And, and, you know, it's just not true, you need help. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. One of the first question I asked um, my business coaching clients when we start to work is, what's your disaster recovery plan? And yeah, it's a great question. They kind of look at me and said, what are you talking about? And I said, well, I kind of looked the same way when I was asked that 25 years ago by yeah. a guy who turned out to be a brilliant man in Sweden who was well, negotiating a million dollar contract with for device manufacturing. Um, and I said, it's, it's, it's kind of scary, but you have to deal with it. Well, what, yeah. what, what defines disaster in your business? So obviously, number one is, well, you're the owner. If you get sick or you get a hemorrhage and you can't show up for work, that's a disaster, right? Well, yes. it could be if you build a company that depends on you. So there's your answer. What else could be a disaster? Well, if my number one sales guy lives and he takes some of my clients away. Okay, so that's another one. What's another one? A key employee leaves. Fine. A competitor, a number one customer, 40% of revenue decides to leave. Fine. Lay those out. Yeah. And then, and then you write a plan of 
what should happen in the event any of these takes place so that you, all you do is you go into an execution mode, just like the reason pilots go to, to simulators are forced to go to simulators is to build that muscle memory that if there is an event in the cockpit that something happens to the plane, they're not going to take that 600 pound manual of the Boeing 747 or 57 and flip around to most ask questions or what happens <laughs> when the left engine burn. Yeah. They yeah. go into boom execution mode. Same thing happens here. And yes, we we don't think about it enough, but we need to because when you have clients and you have responsibilities now, uh, something happens to you. Look, the the cold the cold harsh reality is that no matter how good you are as a business providing services to your clients, and no matter how long how loyal and devoted they are to you. There will come a point pretty quick if you can't service them yep. that they would say, I'm sorry for your loss. I'm sorry for whatever, but I need to take care of me. So I'm leaving. That's yep. not a condemnation of them. But if you communicate properly and you say, listen, I'm I'm going to be out of pocket for a little bit. I've got a little crisis. Please give me a couple of days. People tend to be pretty reasonable yes, as long as absolutely. they don't, right? But if That's they send right. emails and emails go unanswered and everything goes to voicemail and say, oh, I think. I think Vero just we're not a business, so let's go find somebody else. <laughs> yeah, so, I'll, I'll tell you. I'll tell you one quick story on that that uh, is really that will hit this home. In the early days, we had a very small team, um, so there's only about three or four other people besides my wife and I, and we had a family wedding in Jerusalem, so we we're going to be out of the country for a while, uh, and so we prepared the team, and I did this presentation about disaster relief, exactly what you were talking about, Seth. Yeah. I was like, this is what you do if these things happen. I was like, it's not, none of it's going to happen. Don't worry about it. Uh, but but just in case, let's go through it. And I did some funny slides to make people laugh and stuff. And then uh, we left and literally everything happened. Like the building next door, we were in the office the time, blew up. Like it there was a gas leak, it literally blew up. They had to evacuate. Um, so all of our employees, we weren't remote at the time, so we didn't have <laughs> structure. So they all had to figure out how to work from home without us there. Uh, it was It was crazy. But, you know, they all followed the plan to their credit. They're wonderful people that worked for us at the time and some of them are still with us and it was amazing to see, but the disaster plan, I'm so happy you said that for anybody who's listening. I mean, it's such an important question to ask yourself and whether you do a whole presentation or not, but at least think about it, it's, it's really important. We, we don't like to think about, oh my God, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna get sick and I won't be able to come to work, right? I've, yeah. But, but you have to, for the sake of your clients, for the sake of your employees, if you have them, uh, it's important. One of my good friends, and we'll end with this story because storytelling is great, uh, <laughs> was because we were hanging out together. It was a very successful IT development, uh, managed IT kind of company. And he moved all of his clients to the cloud way before people understood what the cloud meant. And one of his clients in New York City was a very successful architectural firm. And one morning, the doors break open, the FBI walks in, they take confiscate every computer in the office, oh look my God. up into trucks and they go away. And so of course the owner called my friend Rob and said, they took all our stuff away. I mean, how do we function? He said, don't worry about it. Ran over, bought a whole bunch of laptops, hooked them up, went to the cloud, was able to resume business literally within a day. That's crazy. Uh, what actually happened to them was the FBI didn't tell them why, but they said, you're running a, um, a, a pedophile pornographic uh, ring oh, no. out of this office. And that's why we're confiscating all the information. It turns out, lesson to be learned, one of the employees left her password and login information taped to her computer because she didn't think she could remember it. And somebody in the cleaning crew that was cleaning the building used the computer to download all this pornographic stuff and, oh, no. and, and that got on the radar and boom, that's it. So disasters can come in all places. Definitely don't that's leave right. your login and password open to anybody, but that's it. So Farrell, uh, this was great. If somebody wants to reach you, it'll be in my show notes. Uh, yeah. Best thing to do is... Yeah, visit me on LinkedIn. It's uh, linkedin.com slash in slash feral. Um, that's where I try to consolidate everything. So um, hit me up there. I love hearing from small business owners uh, and talking shop like this with you is, is one of my favorite things to do. Great. And I realize, shame on us, we are thir three, three times removed on LinkedIn. I'm going to send you a connection and then 
I want to introduce you. Uh, this author is a phenomenal guy. That sounds so, great. Hopefully. All right. Uh, this was great. Thanks for spending the hour with me. It was fun. Yes, it was great. Thanks a lot, Sam. Uh, I appreciate it. Same here.